Hi, welcome from Madrid. I'm here at the SMS conference and with me is Andrew Shipilov. Andrew here is the recipient of the 2014 SMS Emerging Scholar Award, which is an incredible honor. Only one person from our entire field gets that honor every year. And Andrew has uh, an incredible record in the short space of 10 years since his graduation uh, and is richly deserving of the award. So I am Axa Hill. I am a professor of strategy at the University of Minnesota and an SMS fellow. And, uh, and it is my uh, distinct delight and privilege uh, to talk to Andrew and hear from Andrew a little bit about how he got into this field and what is it that excites him about the field, about the work that he does. So Andrew, to start with, how did you get into the field of strategy? Is this something that you were born with? I don't think I was born with it, but my parents were actually uh, educators themselves. Uh, my mother still teaches German in the university, and uh, my father, he was doing research in agricultural science. So for me, the notion of academic life wasn't really foreign. Uh, from my childhood, I, uh, I was exposed to ideas, conferences, uh, or at least talks about conferences, uh, talks about publications, talk, talks about research. So becoming an academic was actually a fairly straightforward uh, career path. And how did you choose strategy? Because, of course, the sciences are really quite different from strategy. Well, strategy interested me because it actually held, you know, it was interesting for me to understand uh, why some companies succeed and others fail. And uh, I was privileged to, uh, when I started my MBA studies in Budapest, I, had a, I have a joint degree with uh, Case Western Reserve University. Uh, one professor in Budapest, uh, his name uh, it was Wade Dennis, he was doing uh, research on emerging markets. And he was a strategy professor. It was, first of all, he, he made me interested in the subject of strategy. I also wanted to teach the cases on Crown, Cork, and Seal, and Call of Wars. These were really cool things, I thought. And uh, Wade early on introduced me to the idea of academic research. We collected data together. We started writing academic papers even before I joined the PhD program. Um, and, and he was a professor of strategy. And I thought that, wow, strategy is actually you know, something that I'm not only am interested in strategy as a phenomenon, but I also want to do research in strategy as, as an academic. And how did your choice of a PhD program influence your career? And your research choices? So when I joined Rotman, uh, some senior colleagues there, Joel Baum, for example, and Tim Rawley, they were interested in networks. And um, you know, through them, I got exposed to the rich literature on networks, and I became interested in this. And uh, beyond uh, Joel and Tim, I also was privileged to work with Henry Grev and uh, Heike Rao during my PhD program, working on, on projects together. And um, I thought networks was an exciting thing. I also read work by David Stark on recombinant property and the, re the capitalism transition, Hungary. And uh, this was very interesting to see how an academic, uh, not from Central Eastern Europe, could, could, could use networks as a paradigm, as a metaphor, and also as a tool to understand how such a complex thing as economic transition happened. So all of those things combined, um, provided me quite a few role models to follow, and that's, that's what I've done. Okay. Your interest in networks, Andrew, uh, does it have something to do with your background uh, and where you grew up as well? Well, I grew up in, I was born in the Soviet Union, and I grew up through the disintegration of the country in the late 80s uh, and the 90s. And it was interesting to see how when the, the formal institutions, which everybody took for granted, were all of a sudden taken away, and that people actually had to rely quite heavily on, on their networks. In fact, if you did not have networks and you weren't able to network at the time, you know, your, your survival in the, in the period of transition as a person would actually would have been in question. 
and uh, they, you know, in uh, during the transition period, people you know wanted to have to know a dentist, a doctor, a person who runs a store, uh, a person who can provide some advice about taxes, and um, because everything had such a high degree of uncertainty, people relied on collaborations. And uh, this was an interesting phenomenon. I grew, as I was growing up, this was interesting to observe. And when I saw people actually studying that in a serious academic way, I thought, well, I, I, could, I could study that, that thing too. Right, yeah. The idea that uh, networks uh, substitute for and take the place of institutions. Yeah, indeed. Uh, or even markets. And when markets and institutions are undeveloped or underdeveloped or falling mm -hmm. apart, that's when the networks, networks become, that's exactly when uh, the networks become a replacement. Even more salient. Okay. What is the difference in your mind between studying networks between individuals and studying networks between firms? Well, it's actually it's a very good question. In fact, one of, that's one of the things where I could see the field of, of network research and strategic management moving in the, uh, in the next five, ten years. Because clearly, when you think about a network between individuals, that's pretty straightforward, right? So who do you or I go for advice? Who are we friends with? Who do we exchange information? And uh, as a, when you manage those networks as a person, you know, you are a unitary actor in, in most cases. And uh, you can actually manage that network on your own. Now, when you think about an organization, there are multiple people who manage networks in the organization. And when we think about our typical industry maps that we draw, you know, university, for example, or GE or IBM, that would show up as a circle in our sociograms. As a single node. As a single node, but inside that single node, there are multiple people, some of whom are really good at managing networks, some of them perhaps are not very good at managing networks. And uh, what, is the, what, is, what is such a thing as trust between organizations? What is such a thing as reciprocity between organizations? Uh, how does trust and reciprocity between organizations translate or cascade down to trust and reciprocity between people? Or how does trust and reciprocity between people cascade up to trust and reciprocity in the organizations? These are really interesting questions, and uh, given the amount of modern data on email exchange or you know, the information which you can uh, collect on the internet or information on alliances and partnerships which exists in the databases, uh, I think you know, so that, that could be something that, that scholars could look into over the next five, 10 years. Right. So you're saying that uh, there are phenomena at the individual level, in individual level networks, that we can see being replicated in some sense uh, in the interfirm network, or at least uh, we can see the extent to which it is replicated in the interfirm network. Yeah, and how in the interfirm networks are distinct from interpersonal networks of senior executives who run these firms. Right, right. And how do they co evolve over time, and how interpersonal network and interorganizational network together affect the firm's competitive advantage? Okay. So the idea that the networks at the two levels of analysis, the individual and the organization, or the individual and the firm, uh, can sometimes reinforce each other uh, and influence performance. Uh, but they might also be substitutes for one another. They right? could so be they're... either complements or substitutes, and uh, what are the conditions under which they're complements, what are the conditions under which they're substitutes, and the ability of firms to attain competitive advantage. Uh, that, I think, would be very interesting. And we don't really need to focus just on the notion of competitive advantage. You can think about the firm's innovativeness. Right. You can think about the firm's creativity. You can think about firm's effectiveness. Of course, at the end of the day, all of that eventually translates into competitive advantage. But um, you, know, there, there are, you can think about more finer grain dependent variables than just performance, than just market share, uh, when you look at phenomena which could be more proximate to networks. Okay. I want to uh, take you now, Andrew, to the book that you've written, which uh, my book, uh, in a manner of speaking, is a, a very, very uh, interesting and an important role uh, for us academics and for us strategy scholars in particular to be playing, which is you know, taking our findings and making them accessible to practitioners. And not enough of us do that. Uh, 
uh, we have these uh, nifty findings, we get these nifty ideas, but they stay uh, within the realm of a fairly narrowly defined journal space. They don't get out to practitioners. So tell me about the book. Tell me what made you write it. Tell me what is the reception it's getting. And tell me what the book says. So the book was born from a question that uh, one executive participant of executive education program at INSEAD has asked me in, in 2007. Uh, after one of the sessions, he came to me and said, Andrew, you, know, you taught us strategy very well. You know, I do understand the importance of five forces. I understand the, the importance of competitive advantage, resource-based view, blue ocean strategy. But that's written, these things are written by someone else. So what kind of research do you do? And what kind of research that you do that I can benefit from? And uh, it took me a while to answer that question, and in fact, took took me quite a few years to, uh, to translate the research that I do on networks and make it teachable. And in fact, throughout this process of thinking through the book, I discovered that at least two other people in our profession, so my co-authors Henry Grev and Tim Rowley, uh, had the same uh, desire to make their work on alliances and networks uh, relevant for the real world. And we've written the book called Network Advantage, How to Unlock Value from Your Alliances and Partnerships. And you know the title pretty much tells you it all. What, what the book is about. The book is about taking the ideas on networks, uh, alliances, partnerships, and making them teachable. So an executive who reads that book, uh, he or she should be able to understand how to benefit from partnerships with suppliers, customers, and even competitors how these partnerships could help their company to reduce their costs, increase the innovativeness, willingness to pay, and basically achieve competitive advantage. And uh, as we were writing this book, we were quite fortunate to be proximate to the executives at INSEAD because to the point that they even helped me pick the right color for the cover of the book. When I was not certain which of the four different versions of color schemes to pick, I went to my class, I handed out different forms, a different you know, basically my, uh, templates of the, of the cover, and I said, which one do you like? And um, the long story short, they picked the color, which the orange, which I think stands out quite nicely on the shelf. But that's, that's superficial, of course. Um, the real interesting part was I was teaching this book together with writing. And the book is filled with tools and surveys which executives can take, fill out, and uh, think differently about their alliances. And I think they can do it because those tools were co-developed with participants of executive education programs at INSEAD, including people whose job it is to manage alliances full-time, including executives who are the CEOs, including people who are neither CEOs nor alliance managers, but who still feel that collaboration is important. And that's why I think this book is, is quite useful for the participants because you know we've created them this book together with them. Let me just... Uh, ask you a slightly different question, which uh, goes to the roots of our assumptions about, uh, about strategy. So if everyone reads this book, right, how will anyone get a competitive advantage? Because they, they would have all implemented the solutions that you're suggesting, and wouldn't they all be at competitive parity? That's a great question, Alex. That's, that's the question that I'm not always asked when I teach the book, but I think that's the question that I should always answer. I think this book gives a lot of open-ended questions. So I would think of this book as a platform uh, to unleash the creativity of individual executives. It's nothing more, nothing less. It's a platform to think about the collaboration networks and how they can improve it. Uh, in different industries, different organizations, uh, different executives may find different answers for themselves with respect to how to structure the network because in every industry and in every company situation is different. But there are certain principles which are general, such as the, the kind of innovation you get from an open network or kind of innovation you get from a closed network the kind of benefits you get from status, the kind of benefits you get from a position of a diversified company in the network. These benefits are different, but when executives read these books, they could think in a different ways about how they could build their competitive advantage. 
So you're saying that you're giving them a general template and how they implement it will decide yeah. who gets the competitive Yeah, I don't give them the fish. CC, I don't give right? them the fish. I give them the fishing sure. rod. Sure. And then some of them can catch a big fish. Some of them can catch a small fish. Some of them may say, well, in fact, I'd like to go fishing because I never thought of alliances as a way to collaborate, to, to grow the business. And at the end of the day, I think that what the, the books like this do, they um, you know, help executives to create wealth in the economy. So uh, one last question, Andrew. You've uh, clearly earned your freedom, if you will, uh, by generating this incredibly uh, impressive list of, of uh, achievements in many, many areas, including teaching and research and service and service to the profession and service to your institution and uh, also getting uh, your work out to the uh, larger public, how will you make use of this freedom and how will you rebalance your, your portfolio, if you will, in terms of teaching and research and service as you get to now enjoy the fruits of the freedom? Well, I think, X, what I want to do is I want to continue uh, writing academic articles but also spend time on thinking how I can translate them to, to the real world. So something which I've done with the book, except maybe you'll look at the networks from a slightly different angle. Um, but the point would be that I still want to, to write for academic journals, because I think our job as educators is to generate knowledge. Uh, but I also want to be able to trans continue translating my own knowledge. And of course, this, the, these, the, two rec the two actions require somewhat different skill sets. And uh, I'm hoping that in, the, you know, in my school, you know, provides me with, with enough support so I can actually hone those skills. And it's, you know, working with PhD students or teaching the executive education class, you get different kinds of joy from, uh, from two of these different activities. And to the extent I can take different kind of joys working with PhD students or teaching executives, I'll probably continue doing that. Wonderful speaking with you, Andrew, and congratulations again.